Wasn't that wonderful? Today's scripture reading is found in John 16, 13. And it says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I've got to be careful I don't mix my sermon with the music, because if I start singing, it's going to be scary. Thank you, Dan, for uh, that song. That was awesome. Um, I'd like to ask a couple questions here. First, that wasn't it. Um, first, I actually want you guys, I know you're all like, you know, kind of falling asleep out there, especially when you see me come up, you're thinking, oh boy, this is going to be long. Um, everybody stand up real quick. All right. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to turn your body north. I want you to face north. Without look, don't... Oh, Pastor Zach's checking the wind over here. Turn your body to the north. Now I'd, I'd like you to open your eyes. Some people either just didn't participate or they're really lost. A few people are are on track, right? Which, which way is north? What? Isn't that north? When, it, when people ask me where north is, I usually go like this. You, you guys can sit down. You guys can sit down. I guess that begs the question, what direction are you going? What direction are you going? What direction are we going? What direction is the church going? Um, direction is a very important thing in life because if we're not going in the right direction, it can lead to uh, disaster. I want to open up with a quick little story. Uh, first of all, I've got to say something real, real fast. Um, I've been at camp for the last five weeks. This is the first church service I have been in almost a month and a half, and I was hoping to hear a sermon today. And here I am given one, so I'll have to listen carefully. Um, and it's also really good to see some familiar faces and a few new faces. Jacob, good to see you. I think Katie and Ashley are here, both wearing yellow. Awesome. We've got uh, Wayne and Amy. Did I say that right? A couple of, uh, I say visitors, but you're really like family already, you, you know. Um, just moved here from California. And of course, you know, Alex Smith, our athletic director, his beautiful white shirt there and sitting next to Pastor Zach. So good to see you guys. Um, I'm happy to be back and uh, get the school year started. It's going to be, be even more fun in a couple weeks when all the empty seats are filled with a bunch of academy kids. Amen? That's going to be super awesome. Okay, so what direction are we going? Back in the 80s, when John Candy and Steve Martin were doing some of their um, humorous little movies, I already heard someone sigh. They're like, oh boy, this is off to a bad start. I don't recommend this movie by any means, but there was a scene in a particular movie by the title of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. And if you've seen the movie, you're probably wondering, why is this guy on the platform? I'm going to bring something out of this. Like, again, I don't recommend the movie. If you know anything about John Candy and Steve Martin, it's always comedy, right? And through their crazy antics and, and weird circumstances, they find themselves driving down the freeway. And through a course of odd events, they are on the wrong side of the road, okay? They are on, let's say, for instance, um, westbound I-70, except they're driving east, okay? So they're driving east on westbound 70. I don't know what highway it was. We'll just say that. And uh, lo and behold, they come up, and there is a family across the median on eastbound 70 going the correct direction. Now, if you're driving along eastbound 70 and you look across the median at the traffic that's supposed to be going opposite direction and you see a car driving parallel to you, you're going to freak out. Well, that happened. They're driving along, and this is this family, and uh, they 
talk. What, what in the world's going on here? They roll their window down and they're waving their arms out the window, yelling and screaming and pointing at the car. And of course, they're telling him, you're going the wrong direction. And I can't remember which one, was it, whether it was John Candy or Steve Martin, but they roll their window down and they look out and they, they're thinking, what on earth are these crazy people doing? And they hear, you're going the wrong direction. And they're all saying that in unison with desperate looks on their face. You're going the wrong direction. They're yelling out the car window. And John Candy looks over at Steve Martin. He says, how do they know where we're going? He rolls the window up and he starts doing little gestures like, you know, eh, eh, a little tipsy. And, and they're the ones going the wrong direction. Don't we find ourselves in that situation from time to time? When we're going the wrong direction and we think everyone else is crazy. Well, like I said, I don't recommend the movie, but that was a funny thing that stuck in my mind from when I saw that years back. We can, we can't find, uh, we can find a lot of, I'm sorry, yeah. We can find ways to find our way in life through Scripture, right? Now, uh, John uh, 16, 13, our Bible text for today, it says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but wherever he, whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Wouldn't that be nice if we were driving down the road we're going up over a hill, if our GPS would say, hey, just over the hill, there's a deer. But GPSs don't do that, do they? Now, fortunately for us, if we take Scripture as our guide through life, um, it does tell us what lies in the road of our Christian paths in places that we can't see yet, over the hill, around the turn. We're not, we shouldn't come up on any major surprises because the scriptures have guided us and given us a pre-warning. Now, interestingly enough, the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Doesn't always tell us exactly, okay? Like we don't oftentimes hear an audible voice like Moses did in the desert when the burning bush told him what to do to go to Pharaoh and let my people go. We don't often have that encounter, okay? Um, as a matter of fact, I have never had that encounter, nor I don't really know anyone who has heard God's audible voice in their lives. Not to say it couldn't happen, but it's just not common. But what we do have is we have the Spirit that Jesus has left with us that does guide us and lead us. Um, what is truth? Let me ask you that question. Can, you, can anyone think of a Bible verse that tells us, when I ask the question, what is truth? Okay, we have this the Spirit who is going to guide us into all truth, right? We have this guide. He's going to navigate us through this mess of an earth that we live in. He's going to guide us and navigate us into all truth. Well, what is truth? Jesus says, I am the way, the life, and the truth, right? So Jesus is the truth. Jesus, in the first part of the first chapter of John, is he, he's known as the, the Word, right? If we look at John 17, 17, and it says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, right? So we have this guide, this navigating system that we, want to, we could call the Holy Spirit, I guess, in this case, guiding us through this life, leading us into all truth. Now, I have an uncanny ability to get lost. I'm one of those people who... I'm not the typical male. I will stop and ask for directions because I know I don't know where I'm going, okay? You know, you have some, of the, some people, the stereotypical man will, I know where I'm going, I'm not asking for directions, and they're 75 miles in the wrong direction before the wife finally convinces them, stop and ask for directions, right? Um, nowadays, we have GPSs that help us avoid that, but I literally can pull off the freeway up to a gas station, fill the tank up, get back in my car, and have no remembrance on where I have come from or where I'm going. Some people are like, what? I inherited it from my dad. I blame him. But my wife just, when she, we're at the point now after almost, well, it'll be 25 years of marriage here real soon. We're at the point now where when I pull into a gas station, she will make me 
look at something, okay, you, where are you coming from? You know, she'll, she'll kind of prompt me along to help trigger my uh, subconscious into really, you know, knowing where I am and where I'm going. I need that. So thank you, honey, for doing that. It's, it saved us a lot of gas and a lot of extra time on the road. But I don't know why. I, I just have this weird thing. Now, of course, we have our phones. They have GPSs on them, and I, I, I rely on that heavily, which is kind of a bad thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just crazy. Um, and one of the things that really just gets under my skin, and this happens to me because I'm directionally challenged, and I'm also not a very techie person. And uh, so a lot of times I'll have my GPS and I'll, I'll go off to get gas or something. And, I'll, and my wife won't be with me. I'll be by myself. And my GPS starts talking to me. Proceed to the route. Proceed, or it says root. It says, do you say route or root? I don't know. Proceed to the root. Proceed to the root. I'm thinking, what way is the root? I don't know where I'm going. How do I know where to proceed to if you don't tell me where to go? Um, because I'm at one fixed point, and I, there's four roads from that fixed point, and I'm like, which direction does lead me to the root? Um, so thankfully, God's word isn't like that. It doesn't always tell us exactly what to do, like I said, with Moses and the burning bush. But it does help us make choices based on what the word says and common sense, which I'm proving to you that I lack a little bit. A little, word, little uh, Bible verse for us. Isaiah 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, we just asked the question, what is truth, right? Okay, the Spirit is going to guide us into all truth. And we discovered from Scripture that John 17.17 17 says, Your word is truth. Okay? Now, your word is truth. Now we have this word that the Spirit leads us into. We have this truth. And this truth is to be a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Amen? You know, when we read the Scriptures, sometimes we come across texts that um, are a little difficult. Um, some, sometimes we read things in the Bible that make us wonder, is it really worth it to follow Jesus? And here's one of those verses that kind of makes a skeptic wonder a little bit. Is it really worth it to follow Jesus? But when we take it in context and we look at the big picture, I think we'll find that yes, it is. And this verse comes from 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. If you're familiar with this, you know where I'm going. It says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. That doesn't sound like the most exciting invitation, does it? He says, come follow me. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a cakewalk. There will be difficult times. But I think what we also have to remember is that whether we're following Jesus or not, there will be, there will be what? Difficult times, right? If you're following Jesus, there will be difficult times. If you're not following Jesus, there will be difficult times. So I guess that leads us into making a decision. Do we want to go through those difficult times alone? Relying on ourself? Falling on our face with no one to help us up? Or do we want the king of the universe by our side, to scoop us up, put our nose back to the line, and like any good coach, give us a slap on the butt and tell us to get back in the game. Amen? I want to read something that I, I read in a book here earlier this summer. Um, Donald Whitney shares a little bit about the Pony Express um, in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. 
It's been gone since 1861, yet people still recognize the name. The Pony Express was a, a private express company that carried mail by an organized relay of horseback riders across a series of 184 stations. The eastern end was St. Joseph, Missouri, and the western terminal was in Sacramento, California. The cost of sending a half-ounce letter by Pony Express varied from 25 to 125 in today's dollars. Depending upon when during the lifespan of the service it was sent. If the horses held out and the weather and the Indians held off, that letter would complete the nearly 2,000 mile journey in a speedy eight to 10 days, as did the report of Lincoln's inaugural address. It may surprise you that the Pony Express was in operation only from April 3rd, 1860 until November 18th, 1861 just 19 months. When the telegraph line was completed between the two cities, the horseback service was no longer needed. Being a rider for the Pony Express was a tough job. You were expected to cover 75 to 100 miles a day, riding hard day and night, changing horses every 10 to 15 miles. Other than the mail, you carried little else besides a revolver and a knife. In order to travel light and to increase speed, the uh, I'm sorry, and to increase speed and mobility during Indian attacks, the men rode in short sleeves whenever possible, sometimes even during the fierce winter weather. How would you recruit volunteers for this hazardous job? Notice they said volunteers. Boulevard Roberts superintendent for the western end of the express, is said to have placed this ad in a San Francisco newspaper in March 1860. Wanted. Young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18 years old. Must be expert riders willing to risk death daily. Orphans preferred. Those were the honest facts of the service required, but the Pony Express never suffered a shortage of riders. What an invitation, huh? Young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18 years old, orphans preferred, right? Wow, I want to go to that birthday party. That's, uh, that's a little disheartening, right? Yet they never had a shortage of volunteers. I don't know whether they just were thrill seekers. You know, they didn't have Mountain Dew back then, so they had to thrill seek some other way, right? Um, but they, they signed up for this, and they did literally risk their lives on a daily basis, and I'm sure some of them probably lost their lives as well, sacrificing comfort, safety, in order to get mail from one side of the country to the other. How much more important is it, is it for us to saddle up and get on that straight and narrow path that God has set out for us, right? Yeah, we know that in the last days, perilous times will come. We have the list of messed up social and moral issues that arise in the last days. But God will navigate us through that and lead us out to his eternal kingdom in the end. Amen? A couple encouraging verses that kind of help us to uh, accept this call. And uh, one comes from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 31.6, and, and it encourages us. It says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Another one, and this is actually, I believe, one of Pastor Zach's go-tos. I've heard him say this verse many times, so P. Zach, I got you on this one, bro. It's from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Is that like one of your memory verses? It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Okay? My GPS might fail from time to time, but if he, with a capital H, is directing my paths, I know I'm on the right course. Even when it seems I'm in the midst of perilous times, and I'm going through hell on earth, I know that the Holy Spirit will guide me through, and that Jesus Christ is, is there, and he's giving us strength. So... Some encouraging verses. One other, this is one of my favorite verses. Um, it's uh, 
John 14, 26 and 27. It says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Do not fear. Let your heart not be afraid. Do you know the most, uh, the, the one command that God gives more than any other in the entire scriptures is do not fear, do not be afraid. He commands us to stand strong and do not fear. That's, that's encouraging. Um, it's encouraging because there are a lot of fearful things that take place in this world. But we know that, like we've, we've already learned, that God is, is by our side and he will guide us through. One other verse here I want to share with you. And uh, this one I think we had on our refrigerator for a while. I don't know where we had that still magnet, but it's from Isaiah 40, 28 and 31. And it says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Am I really going in the direction that God wants me to go? Have I trusted him to lead me and guide me? Will I allow him to turn me onto that straight and narrow path that leads to eternal life? Am I going in the general right direction? But maybe I haven't given my all to God. Maybe I'm just holding on to some little thing that is hindering my course. Just by a little bit. Maybe, maybe just one degree off. Generally, I'm going in the right direction, but I'm not honed in. And I'm one degree off. Well, I found this. I've heard this before and I found this. I thought it interesting. It says, you've heard that if a plane, uh, if an airplane pilot makes the slightest one degree error in his flight path, after traveling one mile, he'll be off course by 92 feet. Doesn't sound that bad. After traveling 60 miles, that error adds up to being about a mile off course. For instance, if she were traveling, this airplane pilot, from New York City to Los Angeles, a one-degree shift could put her in not Los Angeles, but in Irvine, California, about 40 miles to the south. One degree doesn't seem like a whole lot, but when you're talking about a course over a person's life, or in this example, a flight pattern from one side of the country to another, our ending point is drastically different than our original goal. Amen? It is important that we stay connected. We have that GPS turned on because, hey, I hate to say it, friends, we will get knocked off course a little bit here and there. Okay? You take our eyes off the road for a minute. We, we, we ignore this just for a minute, and we're going to, the devil is right there like a raging lion seeking whom he may devour. Amen? But luckily for us, our lion is bigger. We have the lion of Judah, amen, on our side. And he will overcome. We just have to stay connected. Okay, so if you got that little plug in your car to keep your phone, GPS, we need, we need to keep our plug into Jesus through prayer and an open mind and time in Scripture. Um, I read a book. Uh, it's a little devotional type thing, but it was actually, actually not a devotional. It was more like a I don't want to say a self-help, but kind of one of those little motivational things, you know, pick-me-up type thing. It's uh, Sam Parker and Mac Anderson. They compiled this little book of motivational tidbits, and it's called 212 Degrees. And then the, sub, the little subtitle there is The Extra Degree. The basic gist of this book is this. You take a, a pot of water and you crank on the heat, and that water temperature rises, when you get up to 211 degrees, that water is really, really hot, right? 211 degree water is not something you stick your hand in. 
Okay, you stick your finger in there and it's like, yow. So we have a pot of really hot water, right? Now let's go up one degree. You have hot water at 211 degrees. Let's, lay, let's wait with that heat still cranking under that water. That water temperature goes up from 211 degrees to 212 degrees. Now we have a power source that is strong enough to move a locomotive engine. One degree difference makes a difference, my friend. Makes a difference, my friends. One degree. We could be 40 miles off track. We could have the difference of just a pot of hot water or a mechanism that can move a locomotive engine. Amen? Does one degree matter? If, we, if the Spirit is going to lead us into all truth, and we find that the truth is the Word, and that the Word is Jesus, I think we need to be real sure that we're, we stay plugged into Jesus because one degree off is going to lead us astray. And that's just what the devil wants. He mixes truth with what? With error. He mixes truth with error, and he makes it look so inviting. He makes it look so good. And it seems so right. And the world seems to agree with it wholeheartedly, and they paint a beautiful picture of what the world could be if we take this truth mixed with just a little error. And when we get to the end, we find ourselves in Irvine, California, when Jesus is standing there waiting in L.A. Not really, but you get the point. I don't think Jesus would probably want to come to L.A. I don't know. Sorry, Alex. Maybe to go to La Sierra, okay? Maybe to go to La Sierra. All right. Am I trusting my GPS? Am I trusting my GPS? Um, God's Word is my GPS. His Holy Spirit is my GPS. Am I trusting it completely, or am I only putting in half effort? Am I one degree off, or am I willing to let go of that maybe little, seemingly small thing in my life that's keeping me from a 100% commitment? My GPS is pulling me on the right course, but I'm just holding on to this weight that's just keeping me off kilter, and I just can't quite make it. we got to let go of the world, friends we got to trust. What direction am I going? Um, we have to be willing to trust. We need to follow it completely. And the good thing is that we, when we do get off course, and we might from time to time, when we have God as our GPS, He will redirect our paths. Instead of that irritating voice that says, proceed to the root, we'll have God's Word, and He will lead us and guide us back to the root. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for being our direction. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for loving us. Lord, I just want to ask that you guide us and lead us in all that we do. Help us to give 100% because we know that even that will fall short. Um, but we're thankful and we're hopeful that our 100% will meet you and that all the gaps that we are surely going to have will be filled by your Holy Spirit and by your word, by the blood of Jesus Christ who died to fill those gaps. Uh, we thank you for that. We're looking forward to seeing you, and we ask that you'll help us to be prepared. Help us, guide us, and lead us. And we're so thankful that you are so much better than a GPS. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.